activities and get some input on life cycle cost, what's included and what's not. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Chuck, who's gonna do a bit of preamble. Greg, thank you for bringing coffee today. Say thank you to Greg when we're at about slide 32. Just kidding. I thought that was appropriate. <laughs> So, one little thing. Oh, good. All right. We're all plugged in. Um, glad that happened in a timely fashion. Um, so, today um, we're going to have an overly lengthy and overly detailed conversation about life cycle costing. Um, it's a big issue with respect to this particular rule. And um, we've invited Greg Rock. He was at the Department of Commerce. And the legislature said um, that the Department of Commerce and DDS should develop a life cycle cost methodology for state government. So he dove in and applied a lot of uh, not just uh, no expertise at figuring out the math, but also expertise in figuring out the policy um, that goes with it. So that's why we've invited him back to do this particular presentation. Um, I'm going to start with some very simple discussion about uh, what leads folks to having to do life cycle cost analysis within the standard. Um, not everybody has to do it. As a matter of fact, a whole lot of People don't, um, but there are a few niches where, where it becomes a very important part of your work. Um, so first we have to remember that um, there are basically two pathways described in the standard. There are the buildings that can um, identify the end uses, match them up to a uh, end use in the standard, which has uh, targets, and they can compare themselves to that, that EUI target. So those are buildings with energy targets. And you know, there's, there's, we anticipate there are going to be some buildings that do not have targets simply because they have a use that wasn't identified uh, in the standard, and subsequently, um, they can't develop a building-specific target. Um, so those are the two pathways. Um, so uh, this isn't all the language from Standard 100, but buildings with energy targets. Um, if you're less than the target, well, if you're if your building's target is less than uh, what's required by the standard, then you're in compliance. So those folks don't have to worry about this section that we're talking about today. Um, buildings that do not meet the target um, and they put together an energy plan that will meet the target, um, we're not worried about their economic analysis so much. So you can, you go out, your building's, you know, 15 EUI over the target, you put together a program, then you know you're going to hit the target. Um, the, the economic criteria we're discussing today isn't, isn't particularly relevant to, to us as administrators. Um, the standard basically says go out and do it, meet the target. Okay, so. Um, it doesn't have the flexibility that the law does. And so I, I grabbed the section out of the law that said, or implement an optimized bundle of energy efficiency measures that provides maximum savings without resulting in a savings to investment ratio less than one. These folks take the or path um, are interested in what we're talking about today. For buildings without energy targets, um, 
because you don't have a target to compare to, you don't know if you're under over. The way you implement is you do energy audits and you adopt all the cost effective measures you can find. And there's a little more flexibility in how this is applied, which we've discussed at an earlier meeting. We'll probably discuss it more later. But basically, this isn't an OR statement anymore. It's implement an optimized bundle. You're going to do everything that's cost effective in that situation if your building does not have a target. Um, so that's the setup for, for Greg's discussion where we're going to talk about you don't need it anymore. Uh, not so much the optimized bundle, but, but how we evaluate the savings to investment ratio in a life cycle cost basis uh, under the standard. that, any questions for me? I think this is the kickoff. Now, Greg has way too many slides with way too much detail on it. We're going to be sitting in our chairs for a couple of hours. But I promise you, we are going to do some workshopping around all these questions after Greg miles through this stuff. Um, so uh, hang on to your hats, and here you go, Greg. Thank you very much. Pull up the slides here. Turn my back here to try to get everything set up. Oh. Yeah, slide show starts. For those of us joining via WebEx and via call-in on your phone. If you could mute your phone, that would be greatly appreciated because everybody is picking up what's going on in your room. So thanks so much. I'm glad we don't have it going in the speaker here in the room as well. But uh, so as I said, my name is Greg Rock. Uh, I'm going to dig right into it. Today we're talking about predominantly NIST Handbook 135, which is a standard for life cycle cost analysis and how it relates to the EUI standard that was just enacted in uh, House Bill 1257. Let me see how do I get my slides to advance properly. Here we are. So, uh, yeah, the rolling appears to be the preferred method. Um, so, if math and law were your two favorite classes, you're really going to enjoy today's presentation. Um, if they weren't, you're going to enjoy the coffee. I hope at the at the breaks. Um, this is a, a is a technically complex topic. Uh, it's got a lot of facets that engineers pour over like me. Um, and then there's kind of a high level, which we're going to talk yet. about today. Uh, so we're going to fit, you know, three months of engineering economics into so lunch together here. We'll fix we'll move on to how that relates to the bill. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the key and really important variables before we go into workshopping some of those. So I think it's first important to start with what this is not. A lot of people confuse these two. Life cycle cost analysis is not life cycle analysis. LCA is when we're looking at the full well to wheel type of emissions, environmental impacts, and other issues associated with, you know, the, in buildings case, it'd be construction, the deconstruction, the source of the energy, and all these other things. In contrast, a life cycle cost analysis is a site boundary uh, that's just looking at the operational evaluation of the economic costs only economic costs and savings, none of those environmental attributes. So what life cycle cost analysis is, is a very standardized business practice. Businesses have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, I was first introduced to the topic as engineering economics. Almost all engineering students have to go through that course. Uh, you've probably heard of the time value of money before. Net present savings is a very common metric. We're going to be talking a lot today about the savings to investment ratio. But basically what you're trying to do is convert future money into present valued money. So you've got something that's apples to apples. Uh, uh, the future money is not as valuable to most actors as present value. Okay, first break you can take your present valued money and you can invest it in something. And then it'll be worth more in the future than if you had not had that available to you. And there's a lot of narrative descriptions, one here in the informative annex of standard 100, which is a guiding standard for this whole EUI standard. 
I'm going to have a lot of these legal language slides, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over every word on the slide. Um, but this slide deck is going to be available online. So if I'm going to pull out a lot of language that's worth probably looking at, but you may need to go back later on to fully digest some of that language. Um, it is worth maybe noting that we've been doing life cycle cost analysis in the state really since, you know, before 2011, but really got codified in 2011 with, with this definition. Um, and that was around public buildings. So we've been doing life cycle cost analysis for a long time for public buildings. And really at the federal level, they've been doing life cycle cost analysis in a standardized fashion since 1995 uh, for all their federal buildings. So this, this practice has been around for a long time. It's very well researched. You can go pick up a textbook and it'll tell you how to do it. Um, and so this is a, a picture now of it. Rather getting away from the narrative, let's look at what's occurring. And so this is looking at the life cycle cost and benefit timeline of a whole building analysis over a 50 year study period. I think there was a laser beam, but it has disappeared. Right, perfect. So you see you've got you know things like your capital costs. Um, you've got ongoing and escalating maintenance and utility costs. You potentially have some financing that you cashed out against your capital costs. And then at the end, you actually have this thing called residual value, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But essentially, a study period is a finite end to when we're looking at things. But it may turn out that when you reach that end of the study, thank you, that a number of the components that you've installed still have a useful life remaining in them. And you're gonna calculate a residual value of those remaining useful lives and apply that as a residual value at the end. But basically what we wanna do is build up this timeline and then we're gonna take each one of those future values and we apply what's called a discount rate to it. And the discount is how we assess how time affects money. How much more valuable is money today than money in the future? The higher the discount rate is, the less valuable future money is. Um, and so what we're gonna do is take each one of these boxes and we're gonna apply this discount formula, which is a function of how far it is away from the starting point. And then this value, for example, is gonna shrink it comes over here and then it becomes a present value. That present value is a little bit smaller than the future value because of the discount rate that's applied. We're then gonna take all of those present values and there are now apples and apples. So we can add them, we can subtract them, we can divide them as we would like to, to develop a host of different valuation metrics. One of the big ones we'll be talking about is the savings to investment ratio. And it's important when you look at the definition of the saving to investment ratio in the NIST standard that it's always relative to the base case. And so to do true, robust life cycle cost analysis, you need to build one of these timelines for both the alternative you're considering and the base case, what you would do if you don't do that alternative. Now, to simplify it, often the base case is do nothing. So maybe you've got this building and the base case is to continue operating as is, with no capital improvements. That makes a very simplified base case um, that you could compare to. The alternative is, is I take out these lights and I put in new lights with a capital cost and I have a reduced operation and maintenance benefits over time that I can evaluate. And so, I feel like I'm missing one slide I really wanted there, but we'll come back, we'll keep moving. Um, I'm gonna glance, no, all right, it's later on. Um, so when we're looking at these metrics within the, 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 the state of life cycle cost analysis, there's, there's a few variables that are very impactful. Uh, and so we do things like sensitivity analysis to try to evaluate which of these variables are shifting the knob. And so I've done a, a, a sensitivity analysis of these three different energy efficiency measures. One with a 16 year, a six year, and a 1.5 year simple payback, things like weather stripping, lighting changes, um, and you know, just a, a smart thermostat, which can be a very energy efficient measure for, with a short payback. And what happens is that you find that things like the discount rate change the results of the life cycle cost analysis, as you would expect. It's a core principle. It is, it is an underlying value that is gonna affect the formulas that are driving the calculation. And so if you shift the discount rate, that's going to shift the results of the life cycle cost analysis. 
the same thing occurs with the fuel prices. If fuel prices are constant, um, that would create one life cycle cost analysis. If fuel prices are expected to escalate or de-escalate over time, that's going to shift the results of the life cycle cost analysis, as well as the lifespan of the measures that we're implementing. If I say, well, this light's gonna save me, you know, $35 a month, well, it's a big question. Is that light going to last me five years or 10 years or 15 years when I'm doing my life cycle cost analysis? Because that'll affect whether it's going to pay itself off over the, the discounted period of time. So these are important variables that are considered very sensitive uh, assumptions within the, the life cycle cost analysis. So now we're gonna do a little audience participation. Uh, try to sh change things up. On the left, we're saying what things are doing. So if the discount rate goes down, how is that going to affect the number of energy efficient measures that are going to qualify under an investment criteria? I see a thumb up. That is correct. If the discount rate goes down, we get more energy efficient measures. If the discount rate goes up, we're gonna get less of them. Um, how about fuel price escalations? Somebody else. If fuel prices go up, that's right, energy, the number of energy efficient measures go up. Useful life. We've got a down here. Anyone think up? We've got an up there. I would say it is both. Um, functionally, if the useful life is longer, uh, you will have the ability to adopt more practices that will pay themselves off. But also within this law, it says that you don't need to replace a product with, it, with a, uh, an efficient, cost-effective measure until it has reached the end of its useful life. So if we say these lights have another 50 years left in them, they may never get replaced. Um, so, so it can really affect both ways. And finally, we've got the allowed costs, um, which if we increase the number of, or decrease the number of allowed costs, that's going to increase the number of measures. If we allow, you know, every administrative cost, every, you know, lawyer fees and everything that they can come up with be applied to the cost of the measure, uh, well, that's going to drive down what is a cost-effective measure. All of that making some sense to everyone? Questions? <laughs> we made it through the first three months of life cycle cost analysis. <laughs> Nobody? This all makes crystal clear sense? All right. Well, let's stretch a little then. This is going to be a long day, so we're going to take breaks as they come. This would be the prime time to grab your coffee. This is a short break. You're taking two minutes to grab coffee. Try to stay in the room. If you have to run in the bathroom, go for it. And if anyone can touch the floor with their palm like that, now would be the time to show off. Oh, he can? No way. <laughs>
I'm going to say all the people who didn't stand up at all are going to regret that in about 20 minutes. But, but we're going to start thinking about getting going here again. Last call to stand up, stretch it out for 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay, on to part two. Now that you know everything there is to know about life cycle cost analysis, um, how does life cycle cost analysis interact with the standard? And we've got a bit of a nesting doll of standards uh, that are now implemented. Uh, starting with RCW 1927A.200, this is the law that was just passed. Um, it, of course, references standard 100, which you've talked a lot about throughout this process. Standard 100 references the NIST handbook. The NIST handbook references the annual supplement of energy prices and discount factors, and so on. Um, and so what we're gonna look at is kind of starting at the top. There is this section of the law, which is very important to read if you are interested in this type of uh, compliance pathway, but we're not gonna read it in that detail today. You can go back and review it online. We're gonna hone in on a couple sections. Um, first, you know, we, we're talking about an investment grade energy audit. So we need to know what is investment grade. We've talked about that in the previous workshops. Um, we're talking about life cycle cost analysis. And they, they mentioned the period. Remember when I was talking about the study period, that point in time at the end, it's not necessarily defined by anything within the NIST standard. Uh, there is some guidance within the law that talks about it being set by the longest measure within an optimized bundle. So maybe your study period is defined in that fashion. Um, you see the word a lot within the law about implementing. This is about the cost associated with implementing these measures. Um, and then also talk about excluding a cost by, covered by utility or grant program. So you're not, you're not layering in your utility grant into your life cycle cost analysis. It's clearly well defined within the law. Um, they also talk about phased implementation. We talked about that, how that useful life is going to play into the phased implementation because of this criteria in the law that allows them not really to replace something before it's ready to be replaced. And then we've got these two sections, um, which, you know, frankly are a bit of a puzzle uh, for rulemaking to figure out. Uh, there's a bit of a conflict. Uh, the top section is essentially very clearly talking about developing a cost criteria around an optimized bundle of measures with a saving to investment ratio of one. And then the later criteria switches that to a, a, an individual measure criteria with a savings to investment ratio of one. And, and so what we're talking about, the difference there, is you build up your, your list of measures and you've got your, a whole bunch of different measures that deliver different values of savings to investment ratios, all combined, it's a 1.6, but you could even leverage more of these energy savings to get deeper energy efficiency reductions and still do it in a cost-effective manner. Um, but that section of the law essentially allows any individual measure that is less than one to be redlined and removed from the bill, or removed from the, uh, the, the optimized bundle of measures. Um, so that is just something to be aware of, that, that is written into the law. Um, and then as we go down the kind of uh, nesting doll of standards, we see, you know, where does the state law reference the standard? And we've talked about this in past workshops. So I'm not going to spend much on that slide. But then later it goes on in the uh, informative annex. Remember, there are informative and normative annexes. Informatives are ones that aren't by law, but they are informative to how you should comply with the law. And that's where life cycle costing fits in for them. Uh, if you want to know how to do life cycle costing, you should read the life cycle costing manual developed by NIST. And so that gets named pretty clearly. Uh, again, they talk a little bit about using these optimized bundles uh, based on a savings to investment ratio. And so we're gonna talk in more detail about the NIST section. You know, what is in this standard and the, sub, and the, the annual supplement that comes out every year uh, where they set their federal based discount rates and fuel escalation rates. And so we go into it. NIST Handbook 135, Section 2, 6.2. 
talks about the savings to investment ratio. Uh, this is a very important piece of the bill, as everyone knows, if you read through the bill or the standard, savings to investment ratio is essentially the investment criteria that's applied to your projects. Um, with the kind of relief valve exemption there, uh, or re relief valve kind of process, where you can eliminate anything individual measure, this becomes an individual measure savings to investment ratio criteria um, yes. at the end of the day. And well, that can be very complicated because they're talking about these alternatives. Again, we talked about the base case is generally do nothing, especially on a single measure. Um, and so if the base case is do nothing, which will be a lot of, this, a lot of the situations, then the savings to investment ratio can more simply be defined as just all the presently valued savings divided by all the presently valued costs. Does that make sense to everyone about what the savings to investment ratio is? questions on savings to investment ratio. This is important to the bill. You just must be so clear with the way I'm explaining this. Yeah, and uh, so I think as it relates to the bill is it's this section. The implementation plan may exclude measures that do not pay for themselves over the useful life of the measure. So that is how the bill allows a building owner or other uh, applicant to do this. And then what they have done is they've created this combined package. What, we, what this called in bill is an optimized bundle of measures. And in an optimized bundle of measures, you're taking these big energy savings, like a 5.4 to 1 saving to investment ratio, and using it to pay for some other things that aren't, don't pay for themselves but are good energy projects. And so your total project is cost effective, but not every individual measure was cost effective. Now, the bill allows you to redline from that any ones that aren't individually cost effective, which is going to drive up the total package saving to investment ratio. So. It's highly unlikely that any one that's following this pathway and kind of a, trying to implement the minimum number of measures would be doing anything that wouldn't be fairly significantly cost effective and profitable essentially um, because they can remove any of the measures that weren't and they can leverage the savings for profit. Okay. Yeah, the question was, um, a little bit more real world example of where you utilize that redlining ability um, and how it relates to the law. There was another question over here. Yeah, I think that's a very good question that kind of rulemaking needs to figure out. Um, they're, they're, it's not standardizing this exactly how you would do that. Um, there, it is adopted by lots of people in different fashions, but you need to think very carefully about what is that base case. And if you're claiming that some of your things don't need to be replaced till a certain date, that may affect what is the appropriate base case in that scenario. Now again, I think in practice, a lot of these will end up being single measure tests. Um, and so the base case may be relevant only to that single measure. Um, and so if you're not replacing it, it may not apply at that time. Um, but th that's a complicated and important question. OK, I'm going to keep moving along. We've talked a little bit about saving the investment ratio, the basic formula that kind of governs it. Not into basic formulas, but there's a lot more complicated ones. Um, this is what essentially the engineers that you hire to do investment grade audits 
will be doing when they're trying to figure out which one of these makes sense. And all these deltas, what they're trying to figure out is relative to the base case, relative to the base case. And if you have a more complicated base case, it's a more complicated formula, but don't worry, the engineers can do it pretty easily. And we actually have lots of tools that do it. And so one example of a tool, there's lots of them running around, is the Washington State Lifecycle Cost Tool. And essentially what you're doing is adding in a series of what is the useful value of, of the useful life of the product, and what is the capital cost of the product, and then what is the maintenance. And in this case, it, the maintenance is escalated over time. And then how does that affect the energy that you're consuming in the building? That's the input data that the owner or the, or the ESCO is doing when they're trying to evaluate these products. And then all of the assumptions that power the life cycle cost analysis, like the discount rate, are standardized within the tool. Um, and so you've got this type of thing going on where you've got all these different costs of a baseline and an alternative. You can look at the difference between them. So you can say the total cost and the total benefits. You divide the benefits by the cost, and you get your savings to investment ratio. This was looking at adding chilled beams at the point of a new HVAC installation. Um, so does that give a little bit more of the answer you were looking for, how you functionally do the calculation? Okay. So a summary uh, of oh, what- Greg, can I ask a couple of questions yes. uh, about that? Um, one is, it, uh, is, that tool is available uh, free for, People yeah. To use. yeah, the Washington and, State Lifecycle Cost Tool was developed by OFM for public building projects. It's available free to download on their website uh, under the um, forms, budget forms section. I, I think it's maybe not very likely that this will be the tool you will use in this program um, because there's, I think, so, some strong advantage to having things that are, are uh, multi-user, so multiple, the owner, the ESCO, and other people can all access the same data and share it out with the state for compliance. Now there's some new tools that I think can maybe accomplish that that are going to be smoother administratively. Um, but if you want to test out some life cycle cost values, yeah, you can you can download that and um, play around with it. And one other quick question. Um, are any of those fields um, like predefined, like useful life? Who Who gets to decide what the useful life is? Very good question. Uh, we'll be talking about that some in the workshop today. So we'll look at some of the things that are just kind of standardized by the NIST methodology. This is kind of the boring stuff that it figures out for you. Um, obviously, all the metrics and, and formulas are, are standardized. This is how you calculate the savings to investment ratio. Um, they talk about the base case, the study life, how you package things together. Um, they are very clear about the residual value calculations that you can essentially, um, you have to include the residual value if you still have a useful life at the end of your study period, you linearly um, discount it uh, to, to calculate what it is. And they also look at end of life component replacement, but it's fairly limited rules. So I think there's gonna be something, you know, there's gonna be some discussion about that discuss, you know, that piece that you brought up. Timing and cost of benefits pretty clear. They're always going to occur at the end of the calendar year. So you're not doing monthly or hourly utility reporting. You're looking at year-end reports uh, for annualized energy consumption. And then there is that existing component at outlasting their useful life. Very limited rules there. And I think that is important given that section of the law that says you can say that there's a useful life left in this so you don't have to replace it. So now the law, the, 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 the rule needs to somehow standardize what is an appropriate or an acceptable useful life to claim for an existing product. Um, then there are the, the NIST annual supplements. So these are the things that NIST reevaluates every year because they're changing values and they're expected to change. So things like the discount rate. Um, now, it's important to recognize that the discount rate that they're setting is for federal buildings. So it's probably not applicable to state buildings, which we certainly did not adopt it. We adopted OFM's um, discount rate when we developed the life cycle cost tool that was still based on the NIST methodology. Um, a different discount rate may be appropriate for this standard. That'll be a discussion. Fuel price escalations, you know, there, there is a federal values, but they are very regional. Um, our, Electricity and energy is not very similar to Hawaii's. 
um, but we get lumped together in the escalation of energy. Now, the, the raw costs can start at what we're paying, but the escalation rate is going to be tied to how they expect the entire marketplace to shift. And so that's a, a question mark with our changing energy sector. Yeah, so one thing that I haven't done a good job of that I should, should emphasize more is that within this whole world of time value of money, we talk about things in nominal and real senses. And the difference between that is whether you're taking into account inflation or not. And so almost everything we're talking about today is we're applying a nominal discount rate. So that's like the same you would hear if you get quoted a, a loan from the bank. They're quoting you a nominal interest rate. Um, so we're talking about nominal interest rates, which you apply to current dollars. And there's a difference between current and constant. So current dollars are what the actual dollar value is in 20 years when I pay my interest payment. It's $165 a month. And no matter what year it is, I pay $165. That's current dollars, current to the year in which you make the payment. Uh, pr constant dollars are constant to the start year of the study. So we're doing an analysis in 2005. Rather than a nominal discount rate, we're going to use a real discount rate. And then we can apply constant dollars to the, to the future payments. You may be paying $125, but because of inflation, it, it really only, it, it looks more like $135 going out the door. Uh, so it's a very, I kind of glossed over that because it just goes down the rabbit hole a bit. Um, but everything we're kind of talking about today is nominal dollar or nominal discount rates, so what you would hear from a bank, uh, and using constant dollars, so what you would pay in the future in the year you pay it. Um, so fuel escalation rates are going to escalate. Um, you know, when you're looking at your escalation, you need to make sure you're using the value that is either including or not including the rate of inflation, depending on whether you're using a real or a nominal discount rate. Everyone follow that circular logic there? <laughs> See why I glossed over that? <laughs> I, actually, I actually was leading to a little different flavor than Greg went down there. Um, so uh, the, the way the NIST manual applies it is it does recognize normal inflation through all this discounting. But um, the federal government uh, EIA also makes a prediction of how much fuel prices will go up and down uh, in addition, to, relative to inflation. So um, the, the point here is that, uh, that if, if inflation is 3% and your energy use went up 3% every, or your energy costs went up 3% every year, adjustment factor for fuel escalation would be zero because it's just tracking inflation. That's why we do a fuel escalation rate, which is sometimes positive and sometimes negative, is because we're looking at that relative to that standard inflation. And that's why we layer this in. Um, you know, recently, uh, relative to inflation, gas prices have dropped quite a lot. They predicted that it was in our future study, and it was captured in our life cycle cost test. Uh, in the future, they're actually expecting, relative to inflation, that gas prices are going to go up quite a bit. So um, we get that information from the NIST handbook. Um, at any rate, I don't want to over over. I don't want to. I don't want to overdo this, but I I I did want to make sure everybody knew that inflation and then there's these other factors yeah I think that was a very good description of an important value I mean remember when we looked at the sensitivity energy price escalation is one of the sensitivities and especially if you're looking at a really long life measures maybe a, a furnace that's gonna last 50 years it's very difficult to estimate what that escalation might be um, but it is very important that it is standardized when Applicant one is applying for cost criteria, and applicant two are applying for cost criteria. They need to be using the same fuel escalation rates, or it would be causing an equity issue. Um, so standardization is a very important, you know, element in this type of life cycle cost analysis. 
Um, we talked a little bit about useful life. There is a little, there's limited rules, but I think it's pretty clear that we need to build kind of a, a best practice standard. Uh, so we're gonna talk some about that today. The, the capital costs, the same thing. You know, what, what is the best practice for the, the capital costs if they're gonna be estimated? Or is it that we need a bid in hand? Because that maybe is what an investment grade audit means, which is the terminology used in the bill. Um, more discussions around that. And then the maintenance costs, same thing. What's the best standard and practice for how the maintenance costs on these types of measures should be estimated in the future? There's a lot of procedures out there. Yeah, Greg? Uh, Greg, um, back to the useful life. What do you mean by limited rules? Um, my question is, if the building owner believes that the useful life is X and this limited rule suggests it's something else, um, that seems to be a conflict with the language in the legislation, which is basically no requirement to replace before useful life is over. Yeah, I think the, the language is very clear about how you interact with what the, the useful life, I mean, NIST is very clear on once you establish a useful life, how the calculations are done. What is What there isn't a lot of uh, documentation about is what is the useful life of these lights? What is the useful life of this boiler? And there are documents out there that do that, like FOMA produces a useful life table of different energy efficiency measures. Um, but none of those are specified in the law or the standard or NIST. Well, again, you're, you're suggesting that there's a concrete number that would be applied when in fact the useful life in a particular building may be different for a building owner who has a different maintenance schedule, who has applied in, 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 in that building in a different way. And this, the standard the statute says the standard is no building owner has to um, replace until the end of the useful life. And what I'm hearing you say is there's going to be a standard that suggests what that useful life is. And I'm not sure that's what the statute contemplates. Yeah, that'll obviously be a question for rulemaking. Um, but I think from a life cycle cost analysis perspective, it'll be a important to establish some best practices around what useful lives are acceptable, uh, both for when you're creating a new energy efficiency measure, um, because you need to say, if I'm comparing this product to that product, I need a, I can't say that this one has a terribly inaccurate useful life and this one has a better useful life. Um, they need to be based on some sort of at least engineering best estimates, FOMA tables or other, you know, values out there that indicate, you know, maybe it's the manufacturing document. There's a lot of different ways to assess what a useful life might be. Um, Rulemaking will have to establish where they get applied. Um, and some of that's to new building measure standards and some of that may apply to existing building components that are seeking that exemption for replacement. Which, which means there probably will be a lot of exception mating, making made. Wouldn't that be a fair assessment? I think so. Because everybody's going to think they're exceptional. Yeah, let's talk about it. So if you are the minimum implementation guy, you want to do the least possible thing out there, um, there's going to be some of those folks. Uh, what, what is your path? And Chuck kind of laid it out in, in a fashion, you know, you go all the way down to step seven, and you need to implement the minimum number of measures to achieve your EUIT, you've done your investment grade audit, and you can say, oh great, if I do these seven, I, I hit my target. And that's cheaper than implementing all the cost effective stuff, so I'm gonna do those seven measures and hit my target. Or you say, I'm not gonna hit my target, and it's cheaper to do the cost criteria, the investment criteria. And so then you're gonna go forward and you're going to remove all of the investment that all the energy efficient measures that have a greater than one savings to investment ratio, that's gonna structurally weaken the, the cost test. I mean, this is no longer a, a optimized bundle of measures saving to investment ratio test. It is an individual measure savings to investment ratio test. Uh, and then beyond that, you can delay the implementation of any save, any projects that may have a high savings to investment ratio, but would replace a product that is deemed to have a remaining useful life in the building. Um, so I think there is a fairly significant safety net uh, established around the cost criteria in this bill. Any questions on that slide? 
This may be a basic question. That's very helpful for me, who hasn't studied and, and memorized the law. But um, is this a, a one-time activity that, that you do? Um, take one of these three pathways, and then you're, say, the lower two, you're in conditional compliance, and do you just remain that way? Or is there some ongoing requirement to keep that conditional compliance current in some form or fashion? So first of all, this, this process is going to repeat every five years for folks under the law. So that covers a whole bunch of what you just said. Um, conditional compliance, well, first there's a timing issue that I want to remind folks of. I gave some schedule stuff a couple of slideshows ago. Um, you have to accomplish this prior to your compliance date. You have to have your, your work done, your measures installed, and a prediction of where you're gonna be um, by your compliance date. Now, conditional compliance is that float period where you're, you're trying to true up uh, the numbers that go along with having a installed all this stuff. Now, if at the end of that conditional compliance, you know, a, a reasonable metering time period after, after your work's all done, you show that you accomplished what your goal was, you know, what, what was established through this process, you're done. If you didn't, you gotta go back and do more work. Um, so, so it's it's incumbent on you to pick really predictable outcomes, so that at the end of the day you're you're done. Um, at any rate, that's the best I can do, um, you know, right now. So what happens with the ones that you're putting off because the useful life is not up on the equipment, right? That that will be in your energy management plan. And, you know, if it happens in that five-year period, um, you know, we would expect that, that, you know, that that work gets done in that five-year time period. Um, otherwise, you might as well just wait till the, the next five-year time period and book it then. We're going to have to work on that. You know, I can't say I've got the exact answers on any of this stuff. We're all working on it. Correct, correct, and we can we can repeat that if if need be. But I think you got it right. Yes. Oh, so um, the question was a, a kind of a, a reiteration of the first few slides. Um, the two, um, you know, we have buildings with energy targets. The SIR only applies if your uh, energy audit doesn't drive your uh, your energy audit and the resulting cost effective measures don't bring you uh, in compliance with the targets. That's one time you need to do the economic calculation. And the other one is all buildings that don't have targets also have to do this. Appreciate the questions. That's where we were in the in the program. <laughs> Any other questions before we're going to take a longer break, so people can go use restrooms, 
I think I know the answer, but on your slide, is the uh, state gonna define the discount rate and uh, how frequently might that be updated? We'll save that for the next section. That's where we'll be going. All right, so let's take a full 10 minute breaks I think we have time for. Um, and then we can stretch our legs. We're gonna come back. We're gonna do a discussion about some of those key variables that I've highlighted. Um, what are some of the different arguments surrounding them and different things to know about, and then we'll do lunch and uh, pivot to a breakout.
You need a little heat? Oh, okay, good. No, I'm just listening, that's all. Um, life cycle cost analysis. I know, I thought you'd find it uh, scintillating. Just go. Come home and watch something. Well, you if you have something else you'd like to do, you just let me know. What? Well, what do you want to do? Let me put on something so you can watch it. That'll at least help. Just as an FYI, there's somebody who's talking and their phone's not on mute, so we're hearing your conversation. <laughs> Just want you to know. All right, let's talk more math and law. <laughs> so, so kind of as a precursor of this section, I just want to kind of let you guys know what we're going to be doing after lunch. Um, which is breaking into groups to talk about some of these key variables and, and assumptions that we've already been talking some about. Um, and that, that'll be a very good time to weigh in with your thought, your opinions. Uh, a lot of these we need to hear from you. What are your thoughts and opinions on how to do these things? Um, so we'll look at the financial hardship criteria, which I'm, I'll go into a little more detail. I'm going to go into a little more detail on each one of these, so I'll just go ahead and start doing that. Um, there is a section in the law that talks about a financial hardship exemption. 
Uh, essentially, if your building is getting foreclosed on, you're not going to have to do this work. Um, and at the bottom, it does say other conditions of financial hardship identified by the department by rule. Uh, so I think it is an appropriate point of time during pre-rulemaking to start voicing opinions. Are there other appropriate things that should be part of this financial hardship exemption criteria? Um, so there will be a group discussing that and, and bringing forward ideas, which is great. Um, the other thing is talking about a conversation on what costs should be included. So this isn't a life cycle cost analysis methodology question. This is a life cycle cost analysis boundary question. So we know we're going to include the cop, the, the you know the capital replacements, the capital costs, the ongoing maintenance and utility, um, but we don't necessarily know exactly how to handle a lot of the, you know, what is the construction cost? Is 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 the evaluation of projects that can be done part of implementing the measures? Is the design cost, hiring the architects and the engineers to make it look pretty and function right, part of the construction costs? Um, are the administrative costs of filing your paperwork every year with the state part of your financial investment criteria costs? Um, and that list could go on and on and on uh, about a discussion of what could be permissible costs and what maybe are not permissible costs. Uh, there's also a question about financing. Uh, this is a fairly complex one. How should financing be handled within this bill? Um, there are kind of two approaches, I think, that be thought about. One is that you are including the financial costs within the cost criteria. Um, so if someone can prove that they can't get money for anything but 25%, that would dramatically change their cost effectiveness test compared to someone else. The other way is to maybe include that in the economic hardship criteria that we just saw before. If you're unable to get money or you cannot get money at a reasonable rate, maybe you don't have to do this. Um, so those are those are different ways to think about that issue. There's probably a number of other ones. Um, just flagging some of the things that are going to be topics of discussion appropriately. Um, so now you guys know how to do popcorn uh, brainstorming, right? This is where you get involved, you just shout something out. You don't, doesn't need to be right, doesn't need to be wrong, but what are some ways or references or methodologies, ways that we can standardize that useful life that we've been talking so much already about? Who's got something? I guess you should turn on your, your little mic before you shout it out. Nobody, nobody's a fair, uh, familiar with any, any lists of useful lives? Ashray, Equipment Life, yeah. Most manufacturers advertise useful life. That's right. Manufacturers have uh, useful life advertised in their products. If it's energy efficiency, useful life, and like the regional technical panel on power plants also has Yep, a lot of useful lives in the technical advisory groups and councils. A lot of utilities in the room. Don't you guys have useful life tables for lots of measures? I was gonna say those are usually derived from like RTF or other yeah, things like that. OMA, commercial buildings has useful life tables. Um, so there, there are a lot of different sources. Maybe there's other questions about what's the appropriate one to use or what's the appropriate methodology and application. Um, those are things that we're gonna to wanna to talk about. A complicating factor is uh, tech technology obsolescence. It seems like as an owner more and more, that's driving equipment to shorter useful lives, whereas it may may be able to last longer, but the technology for controlling it is no longer supported. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Like maybe you put in uh, halogen light bulbs, um, or co sorry, compact fluorescent light bulbs, which were more efficient, uh, but now the LED is so cheap that, you know, with a two-year simple payback, if you tore out those, those uh, compact fluorescents, you could get, you know, back on top with your LEDs very quickly. And so do you hold on to that old lighting system for 10 years, even though it would pay itself off in three? I guess I was thinking more about like a PLC on a burner control for a boiler that that may no longer be supported six or seven years from now, and you don't know that as an owner buying into that. 
you, you learn it a year, be, year or two before the manufacturer no longer supports it and you're faced with having to and, and make it a replacement. An important point of this is that you have measures that may have within that measure different components of different life. Maybe you've got boiler housing that's going to last a long period of time. You've got a control unit that's going to last 12 years. And so you need to look at useful life of multiple components within a single measure. We have um, two or three actually just came in. Uh, RTF as a suggestion. RTF? A yep. AHRI useful life tables. USA General Services Administration has useful life tables for federal facilities, it suggests. And those are our three. Good work online, popcorn and from, the, from afar. So same idea, but what about standardizing the capital costs? Um, what is the cost of buying something? Maybe it's a, a bid in hand, but if it's not a bid in hand, how are we going to determine it with some level of standardization so that there isn't inequity amongst applications just based on the number they assign to the cost they think something might, might be? How does code minimums play into this? How do new changing laws that may restrict um, certain types of energy use or certain types of refrigerants? Um, all very good questions. Online we have uh, the question, it says, regarding useful life, what if there is a state or federal efficiency requirement that will be in effect in a few years? Is there one, what was the question? <laughs> What if there is state? Oh, what if there is? Yeah, state, uh, state or, or federal, federal standard. Yeah. Well, I think you know rulemaking is an ongoing process. So, uh, if something were adopted federally that made a lot of sense to adopt statewide, um, in a future rulemaking, that would be an opportunity. I don't think there's anything today of that nature. Certainly not referenced in NIST. I'm going to give a simpler answer. Okay, as it applies to conducting an energy audit and installing measures, whatever the federal standard or state standard says, you do that. Even if there's a future standard, um, that's not going to impact what, what the building owner's doing. I didn't hear like RS means. Um, there's a few other lists of costs. Again, the manufacturers, of course, list their retail prices, um, which could be. Oh, you seem so familiar. They might cost. Room irrigation. But that could be. Um, um, that's right. How, how yeah. much of an investment for the audit is, or is it phase one? Hey, phase you about Roosevelt where they stole the those things off the. And off finally, the um, standardizing maintenance yeah. costs. Yeah. Uh, the, the Board members, Board please Board mute your phone. A lot of these measures can have reduced maintenance costs, especially like lighting where you don't have to. Uh, I took pictures in there. I, yeah. um, there's a lot of that lately. Like, yeah. I don't think I knew about it for road sure. or I knew about it for I'm thinking like 30,000 gallons or more. Evaluating what's going to cost. Uh, uh, maybe I knew about that one. Uh, you may not have thought of it. There's, there's yeah, somebody a, on the phone who is talking. Please put yourself on mute. Oh my gosh, what school? You're, you're catching me off guard. No, it's uh, fine. I just want to poke my head in. No, there was some scrolling through. Yes, okay. I did know about <clears throat> Roosevelt and I tried to ask. Uh, SPU, if we could get a rebate on nice. it, and they said not for vandalism. Oh, and I'm like, me. really? Um, well, wonderful. Not even for a school. Uh, uh, fuel price escalation. Uh, oh, yeah, just an email. Uh, uh, there was, uh, oh, you no, this is you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is going to be gnarly. Yeah. I am not Has excited. anyone figured out how to go into it? Hey, Graham Goodman, mute your phone. Or I want to make sure that. You did on this forecast of the future just with this rule. I think that would be to be administratively feasible. Um, again, with these types of issues, it is snake oil. No one knows what the price of energy is in the future. We know it's not going to be the same as today. 
Uh, and so we have to estimate based on the best available science and market conditions and other things what it is. And they're going to be wrong. Every fuel price escalation you ever see is going to be wrong. But it is important that it is standardized. When you're doing this type of analysis, you need to be working with a standardized assumption about what the future looks like. And that assumption about the future should be updated over time. How is it updated every year, every five years, every 10 years, two years? That's maybe another question. And now we get on to the big one, discount rate. I've got a lot of slides on this because I just want to walk through the different perspectives. Uh, this, this is the one that you know functionally shifts the entire life cycle cost analysis because it's a core principle of life cycle cost analysis is what is the value of money over time. And so, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways we could look at this. Um, and so I'm just going to walk through some of the different ones. And we'll kind of leave it that. We're going to take lunch probably after this. We're going to come back. We're going to workshop around most of these ideas. Feel free to ask questions as we go through it. Um, but this, this will take us to lunch. So, uh, there is within the NIST handbook 135, the annual supplement that is referenced and produced every year by the federal government, specifies what the discount rate is for all DOE projects and federal contracts. And it actually uses a methodology where it's looking at the cost of borrowing for federal buildings, but determine that the cost of borrowing is lower than a floor that they have established of 3%. So they are using the floor of 3% for all federal buildings and contracts except for a smaller group of buildings uh, for which they are not subject to that price floor and they're actually using the current federal rates of borrowing uh, based on kind of an average of what the useful life is. So if you're looking at a seven-year measure, you're working with a 1.3% discount rate. If you're working in a 30-year study period, you're, you're working with a 1.5% discount rate. And these are all in nominal terms, so similar to what you would get from the bank. So that's, that's an opinion, probably not directly applicable in that it's federal buildings and based on federal rates of money. Um, it does talk briefly within NIST Handbook 135 about you know, how editorially you would do this in a, in a daily business activities. Uh, it talks about being you know, usually based on market interest rates, nominal interest rates, which we are talking about, that nominal is used to discount current dollars. Um, and it also mentions the earning power of your money. Um, and I, that's kind of a way that I first heard this, you know, was the, the minimum attractive rate of return, which I'll talk about in a sec. But if we, if we look at a cost of borrowing for commercial loans, well, maybe there are averages out there that would be applicable to this. Um, you know, value penguin states that the, in 2019, the average interest, interest rate on commercial real estate loans is around four to 5%. Um, so there, there's a value. I don't, I don't know if that's something applicable to this type of process, but it, it, it gives a sense of where the market currently is and maybe a way that you could try to figure out how it shifts over time. I think there's more applicable ways to this standard. Um, and then there is also this idea of the value of my money, the opportunity cost. You're a businessman, you're not looking to just get a return on your capital, you want a return on your investment. And minimum attractive rate of returns are saying, what is the minimum amount of money I expect to get for my dollar? If I'm gonna spend a dollar, I wanna get at least a 12% rate of return because I'm really good at picking stocks. Um, and so that criteria is gonna be different for every different individual based on the opportunities they have for other investments, uh, maybe their ability to pick stocks right, or the bank loan they're getting, the interest uh, and that they get when they put it in the bank, or maybe they can loan money out to a friend that needs money bad and willing to pay an enormous interest rate for it. Who knows? So there's a lot of different variables that would go into trying to figure out what is any individual's minimum attractive rate of return. Uh, but even within that, you know, most corporations are looking at a weighted average cost of capital. Um, so most businesses still functionally, their minimum attractive rate of return is a function of how much they pay to get money, whether that's from their shareholders, the bank, or other forms of, of, uh, of capital. 
There is also an argument on the other side of the coin that there should that, that if you are dealing with policies that are about public policy and policies for public good, we should be using what's called a social discount rate. The social discount rates are generally much, much lower than the market discount rates. And this may have some relation to the fact that you know, the greenhouse gas emissions should, you know, are called out to be maximized within the legislation, um, which calls into question, is this a climate policy or is this a buildings save money policy? What type of policy is this? And I want to dive in a little bit more detail to the Northwest Power Conservation Council seventh plan, because they've done quite a bit of work around what is the appropriate discount rate for this particular marketplace, the Northwest region, um, specifically in regard to market transitions in the utility sector and energy efficiency investments in the building sector. Um, so it is fairly related to this standard. Is it directly related? Maybe not, um, but, it, but it does have some relation that I think is worth highlighting. And they talk about um, within this that they're, they're trying to, to reflect in the seventh plan both the descriptive and the prescriptive approaches to identifying the appropriate discount rate. And so when we're talking about that, a descriptive approach is kind of backwards looking. You know, what, what is the current market condition last year for the borrowing of money? And, and the argument is that the, the discount rate should be very closely related to the level of interest rates uh, in the marketplace, as we've been talking about. They identify a host of different cast of characters and some, inch, some loan rates that were applicable to them. They, of course, had to forecast. They're looking at a four-year period uh, in these forecasts, not just an individual year. So they're saying, and based on what we think the interest market is going to do over the next five years, we're going to lock it in at that rate and use it for all the analysis, and then we're going to reevaluate in five years. Um, so that certainly has a lot of administrative burden benefits in terms of not having to constantly be changing a value that is going to shift the results of almost all of the evaluations. Um, and then they talk about the prescriptive approach. And this is much more about a deeper question of, of what is the social cost associated with the things we're trying to evaluate. Um, they, they use this language, you know, how then should society weigh my consumption against my granddaughter 100 years from now? If you apply a 5% discount rate to that 100 years, you know, you're valuing her inputs and outputs economically as less than 1% of yours today. Um, so is what you did do today 100 times more valuable than what your grandchild might do, your great-grandchild? It's, it's, it's a, a different level of question. Um, and so that's one of the things that they look to do within their uh, rule setting where they landed on 4% was to balance both the, the prescriptive and the dis uh, descriptive approach to evaluating discount rates. So kind of within the discount rates, there's these three kind of basic arguments that, that float around there, that, it, that it's what can I do with my money, the minimum attractive rate of return, I need to earn a profit, and profit could be a very big number for a lot of people. Um, there is the cost of borrowing that we need to go look at what the marketplace is when we're talking about nominal interest rates. You know, there's the federal down at 1.5, the state's been floating around 2 to 3 percent, commercial loans we saw in the 4 to 5 to 6 category, and then when there's these high risk loans, you know, people may need to go out and get hard money to take on a construction project and they're paying 12 percent interest rates. How does that factor into this? Um, and then there is, of course, the societal discount rate, which we were just talking about, which is generally lower, uh, generally less than 3%. And there's a number of people arguing that it should be a negative number because uh, the value of your grandchild may be more than yours. From online, we have a question. What is the state using for its LCCA discount rate for buildings? So the life cycle cost analysis um, discount rate for buildings, uh, public buildings in Washington state, uh, is, re is a requirement that only applies to buildings that have a capital expenditure over $5 million. Um, but for those buildings, they are subject to a discount rate which is established annually by the Office of Financial Management. I don't have the current value, but I think it's in the low 2%. If 
Final slide before lunch, so questions, questions. <laughs> Which one is it? Lunchtime or questions? <laughs> All right, so um, first I am gonna ask if there are any questions one more time before we move on. Um, so, one more. Just to clarify, a uh, lower discount rate means more advantage to EE measures, is that correct? Yeah, because the future values will not be discounted as quickly. get nominal and real mixed up. I look it up every time. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so I had asked earlier about how frequently this gets updated and you kind of implied that administratively it becomes a real challenge <laughs> if this happens frequently, but do you, do you have any thought or is again that gonna be part of rulemaking? Um, how, how that how that discount well, rate public that's, publication? That's work. a very good question. Um, so almost everything in the standard we can set a sort of set of rules, put them in place in November, and no issues except for this one. Um, you know, I'd anticipate most of these projects are done in like 2025. Perhaps we should consider a rule um, adjustment in 2025, just really focused on this very issue. Simply because we, we know that this is something that's typically changes over time. Now, it, I don't know the answer, okay? That was speculation. Thank you. Um, so I, are you going on the assumption that you want to come up, up with one discount rate that works for every building that has to comply? Well, I think every building type, I should say. I think there's a split between public and private ownership. Mm -hmm. This is a different thing right. on the borrowing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the boundary condition is certainly in order. There's also the, the, you know, Craig introduced uh, the fact that there's a blowout valve in that disadvantaged business mm -hmm. um, option. So um, I think our discussion this afternoon will reveal the range of options. And okay. again, we'll have to rule to make the cottage. Also, like during the gestation of a project, when do you get to lock in a discount rate? And did you, if you do lock in a value, are you allowed to change it if it's uh, advantageous to you uh, later on, as in the discount rate goes up and you decide, I don't want to do anything? Um, well, that's, that's part of our timing question. Are we gonna set a specific rate or are we gonna set a rate relative to something that's trackable? and identified a trackable, you know, we could do the Fed plus, we could do, you know, some other use case. I, I don't have an answer to that question. As an administrator, I would like to know in 2025 um, what the boundary conditions are. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm after. Right, so Greg, do you want to go back to your set of um, your, your breakout group list? No. Okay. So, um, so we're gonna do these. So, are we gonna go through these and have people rotate? How much time do we have? Okay. 
you'll probably get to pick three out of four of these, let's say, participate in a group. Also, folks on the phone, I know you feel like you've kind of been left out of some of these discussions. We have a plan to bring you in. Um, we're gonna have one of the discussion groups rotate to Annika's desk. You're all gonna take a mic and, and you're gonna make your discussion available to the folks online that way. Um, and that way, uh, you folks on the phone and on the web are gonna be a lot more involved in the discussions than we've accommodated previously. We hope that helps. That means that the, the groups will probably be static, but the, the subjects will rotate. Um, so figure out three out of four of these you wanna participate in, so you're, you're ready for that. Um, we're gonna have a huddle to make sure that we staff this the best we can. And we will begin again at 12.10, 40 minutes lunch. Greg bought a lot of coffee. <laughs> anyway, thank you.
Hello, everyone. We'll be reconvening shortly. We're over time for lunch. Emily is going to herd folks into groups. Is that a, is that a, a acceptable term? Sure, exactly. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Did everybody get enough lunch? There's lots of coffee, I hear. Coffee? Okay. Um, so we took a chance uh, to talk about the topics over lunch and decided that we thought the financial hardship criteria might go a little quicker than the other topics. So we're gonna do that together collectively as a group. So for the next couple minutes, we are gonna talk about financial hardship criteria and what kind of input ideas you all have and commerce should take into consideration. Can I have somebody record up here? Monica, Austin, Anna, somebody, everybody's name starts with A. Convenient. Okay, so here's the definition of financial hardship um, exemption. So it's got to meet one of those following conditions of financial hardship. Greg talked about that this morning. And this is the area that we really want to have some discussion about and get input from you all. Other conditions of financial hardship identified by the department by rule. What would you like us to think about with that? What would you like to capture? Criteria for financial hardship. Use your mics, please. Thank you. Let's say a building is so far out of spec that it just can't get there. Okay. Define out of spec for me. Uh, say a hospital. I'm not sure what the EUI we're going to decide on for okay. hospitals. Okay. It's a fairly typical inpatient hospitals are all, pretty much all okay. the same use. Um, you know, if it's ASHRAE, it's around 160 or so, um, maybe a little more. Uh, we've got hospitals in our district that are probably in the 400, 400 to 500 just on the electrical, and I know they use gas too, okay. and I have no visibility to the gas. Okay. So by out of spec, are you saying by energy use intensity or by building conditions or both? Just want to make sure we're capturing it. Well, the metric is energy use intensity, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, it, it could be. It's a multiple of things. Okay, great. Thank you. Good one. What else? Okay. So triggering other more substantial upgrades, renovations, and work. Yes? Okay. And I'm repeating back so folks on uh, WebEx can hear. Yes. So another one, um, this building we're in right now, it's on the historical register, cannot improve the windows. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're never going to get to a metric that will, will meet the standard. Mm -hmm. So buildings on the historic register, I believe we do have language in the RCW that addresses that and it's connected to the measures that would be impacted by the historic criteria, the facade. Windows would be a great example of that. Yep. Disruption of operations. Okay, disruption of operations. Tell me more about that. Uh, if the improvements shut down that building's use mm -hmm. over a period of time and the financial costs associated with that. Yep. Okay. Or, or even, it may not even be financial. Like, mm -hmm. for example, in the hospital situation, it just may not be, it may be an imperative, social imperative that's continues at operations. Great. So disruption of operations, discontinuity of operations. Um, we talked about that in the last workshop um, in terms of displacement. Yeah? Okay. 
Good one. What else? Amy. Um, perhaps like an uh, ownership model that prevents uh, action. So I was just talking to somebody about family association ownership in the international district where you have eight or 900 owners um, and it's very difficult to get them all to agree on a path forward. Okay, so ownership structure could impact their ability to get this done. Yeah, okay, what else? Yes, funding cycles for public institutions. I've been thinking about that a lot. Schools, for example, state-owned facilities. What else? What else should we be thinking about? Uh, two possible ideas, either when maybe the building life is actually somewhat short, like it's anticipated to be torn down in the near future in, in busy areas with a lot of construction. Um, or where the optimized bundle of measures is some percent of the evaluated building value, mm -hmm. where it's like you're investing a lot of money into a building that's just not worth that much and yeah. may also be at risk of being torn down or redeveloped soon. Yep. Okay, just to repeat that, I heard two issues. One is the optimized bundle, the cost to implement that really exceeds the value of the building or there's gotta be some kind of threshold there. Um, the other is useful life of the building itself could be something to consider. Anything else? Yes. Great suggestion. So we heard ownership structure earlier from Amy and what I'm hearing is lease structure could impact that as well. Okay, what else? So to follow on that, so a situation where uh, a building has long-term leases mm -hmm. and the operator of the building really has no um, ability to pass on those expenses, is that what you're thinking? ownership versus occupancy, how that lease is structured, et cetera. What else? We have a lot of buildings in the Puget Sound area that are, that are probably gonna get requested to do retrofitting for earthquake. And do those additional uh, mandated changes, uh, does that, can that be included in a financial burden uh, assessment? I'm nodding to acknowledge that I heard you. I can't yet say I agree with that, but I hear you. Um, yeah, so really we heard, we heard that issue come up earlier. So the magnitude of work that we're doing to the buildings, at what point does it um, impact other structural needs, other capital investments, seismic upgrades and retrofit is what I heard you, heard you say, which is a really good point. We've got a lot of those unreinforced masonry buildings in the state. Yeah, good one. Austin, uh, we've got something online. Owners who maintain a nonprofit that where the cost for improvement would substantially impact the nonprofit's ability to serve its clients and continue its operations. Will you say that again? The microphone is. The question or the comment is for owners who maintain a nonprofit status where the cost for improvement would substantially impact the nonprofit's ability to serve its client or continue operation. So financial impact to nonprofit organizations impacting their ability to provide their service or work. What else? Anything else? We're doing good. This just got mentioned earlier in the session, but also mm -hmm. Okay, cost of financing. Financing for the improvements themselves. 
Okay. So what I'm hearing from you is the importance of looking at this through an equity lens. Um, we had a great discussion about that in the last workshop, equity versus fairness, and how do we look at that for setting targets by building type versus delivering incentives versus how we write rules. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. We've got all kinds of materials on the website. Okay, what else? once going twice okay this will not be your last chance to comment on this this is our opportunity to assess your thinking use that to help shape and inform how we're going to approach this issue and there'll be more opportunity to comment uh, in the winter and if you have any great ideas that come to you after this workshop don't hesitate to shoot us an email at the buildings at commerce.wadac.gov email address So these are all great general comments. Let's consider the administrator. Um, my, we need you folks to, if you've you got a particular thing that you're interested in, we need more specific input on how we might accomplish this. So, I, and I know this is, you know, we're brainstorming now. But eventually, we're going to have to think about this in really well-defined terms. So any thinking you can do around that would be great. I also want to react to some of these comments. Um, this is an overall exemption from having to do anything. OK, so um, that's one way to get there. Um, the other thing is we have a bunch of cost considerations in here. Let's say um, doing an HVAC system change does require an earthquake upgrade. Let's say that's it. Well, that's all part of your cost structure that goes into life cycle costs. And we'll probably bust it out. Okay, so um, don't think of all these things as exemptions. Also think about how they fit into the other structures of the standard. Um, the, the ultra high UI target thing, you know, they've got very high UI. No, they're not going to ever get to their target. It's going to be a bunch of buildings that never get to their target, but they're going to go through the process, get what they can, and, and then qualify for the standard. So, at any rate, um, more ways to think about this than just this overall exemption criteria. But where you think there is an exemption, we're going to need to think hard about how someone would administer that and what definitions we need to do that. All right, now we're going to shift into our workshop. We already took care of topic one for now, so we're going to focus on the three remaining topics. Who's doing covered and included costs? Greg is going to be facilitating discussion about covered and included costs. David Van Hold is going to be taking useful life, capital, and maintenance costs. And Chuck is going to be taking discount rate and fuel escalation rates. What we're going to have you do is self-select into three groups. Make sure we're somewhat evenly distributed so we don't have two in one group and 20 in another group. We're going to spend about 15 minutes talking through each topic and then rotate through. So you'll get a chance to provide input on all three topics, but stick with your same group and rotate through. Greg is going to be here in this corner. Does that work? We will we'll use a table with Austin. Chuck, where do you want to be? We're going to take the microphones with us. We're trying to figure out how to engage with remote participants. We're going to move microphones with us. Yep. Yep. We got it. We got a laptop. We're mobile. Okay. Chuck, what corner do you want to be in? Okay. 
Chuck and Anna are back here. Discount rate and fuel escalation rates. David, process of elimination, here you go. Okay, so grab a group. Um, the one caveat is um, the group that starts with, where are we starting, Annika? Greg, okay. Annika and I are gonna be rotating through with microphones so the folks online can hear and participate in the conversation. So um, just be mindful of that. We're gonna be engaging with the remote participants. Okay, go.
grab the headphones for everyone. Okay, thank you. Well, I was going to say, at Fred Hutch, we have a table of all the equipment that's in our facilities, and we've assigned useful lives that are just out of, you know, engineering sources, and we're constantly going through and evaluating that piece of equipment. We don't just replace it just because it's at the end of its useful life. Is We, we judge, is the equipment running correctly, you know, so I think it, it's, a, it's something that has to be analyzed and looked at as to whether or not as a piece of equipment gets closer to what the book says is the useful life, is it really the end of the useful life or can that thing be extended? Uh, and I'll comment on Hello. 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 Say audio test test. Audio test test. See how it's going through there? Oh, yeah. Testing, testing, does this work? <laughs> don't hold it down, yeah. All you, you don't have to hold it down, Jay. So I'm just wondering, is are, are these criteria also just, uh, are they industry-wide? Uh, are there gonna be any caveats? Just wondering if there are any caveats for. You have to punch it to a screen. Okay. It's green. Uh, for uh, around industries or, or uses of buildings for the life cycle costs. I mean, can, can you explain that more? I'm not sure. Well, I'm just. I don't know specifics about. You know, uh, ways to look these up, but I do know that within our school system. Uh, certain things get abused a lot, and other things last longer because they're not being used 12 months out of the year. Right. Okay. <laughs> and just, I mean, just to clarify, is the interest in the useful life is only for the calculation of we're, we're you know we're trying to figure out uh, the life cycle cost analysis part of this, right? So it's not really like a... Yeah, I think for the purposes of this conversation we're talking about is an input to the life cycle cost analysis because it's a sensitive area. Yeah. I mean, Although, does it also feed into the issue of you, you don't have to replace your equipment before the end of its useful life if it right. applies in both situations? Yeah, because there is the, there is the exclusion for the ability to defer repairs until the end of the useful life. So that, that's actually a very good point. And so does that, I mean, if we have equipment that is in good shape, but if you go by the book, it's past its useful life, but it, it's, you know, it's still running well and stuff like that, is there any indication that that would play in to this, like a review, an engineering review of the existing life of the equipment even though it might be past whatever standards might be out there for useful life. Yeah, I guess how I would think about that is, um, uh, I think it would just kind of remove the ability to make an exemption on that behalf. So if you have a 25 year old boiler and it's still running great, but the useful life ends up being 20 years, um, you can't use 
like if it's past that useful life, you can't um, use that as a justification to not do a project. Um, so, but maybe it means, I don't know, trying to drill into operations more or something like that. Comments on capital or maintenance costs? As we talked about useful life stuff, we want to shift to comments on sources for capital costs or maintenance costs. Um, I'll offer one. Uh, was involved in a project some years ago, substantial amount of research at Southern California Edison around uh, uh, O and M costs uh, around O and M programs, uh, utility O and M efficiency programs. So I believe substantial research has been done there. It's worth us doing some looking at uh, other utilities and O and M programs, what they've looked at in terms of uh, economic criteria for O and M programs. Uh, yeah, from PSE, we have a, a strategic energy management program which focuses on O and M, and we've uh, established a. Uh, cost, like how we run our cost effectiveness is based on what we think um, uh, an FTE costs in that role. So that may be a, um, that may be a component or a data point. So when we did studies in the federal government and they talked about, you know, reducing your maintenance costs, it was very hard to take credit for any of that because the requirement was that, well, if you have an employee doing that work, and now you've done a project and now that doesn't need to get done, that employee is still getting paid and they've moved over to do something else. So there's not really a cost savings at that point unless you were to you know, shut down a boiler system and then you don't have to have guys there 24 seven and you've literally moved people out of the organization. So that doesn't happen easily if that's going to be the requirement is to to actually see cost savings not just shifting costs around right agreed that, that's been a barrier i would agree that's been a barrier i think one of the goals is to remove i think one of the goals of the program might be to remove some of the barriers to low cost o and and no cost o and measures and that is a good argument for researching that to some extent anyone else we had a comment online about um, capital costs if um, bids are comments on capital costs or maintenance costs and probably good at this point if we're opening it up to identify the group that you're speaking to of which of these three yeah, what, what keeps someone from going to their favorite contractor and just bid, just getting a high bid every time i mean if you if you i mean how do you how do you validate that the bid process was legit you know if you're in the business of trying to avoid doing things bidding may be a great way to go yes Right, and, and the other side of that coin is, you know, the whole definition of investment grade auditing and who will actually invest based on what, whose decision, right? But investment grade auditing language arose mostly around the context of energy service contracts where, where, the, where the ESPC was actually doing the work. So they would invest on the project that they designed, right, with, with, with a whole set of understandings. But if there's a third party auditor, then the question is, who's going to actually make investments based on that person's uh, and calculations? And so the bidding issue comes into that uh, both uh, for uh, O&M and capital measures, and it's a fraught issue. Test, That's one of the reasons we're test. seeking some basis for standardization, as challenging as that may be. I already mentioned this one uh, earlier, Test. but uh, in terms of um, uh, funding funding cycles for us, you know, for large uh, capital projects, they are tied to levies, and we are beholden uh, to those monies uh, for for those particular projects. So anything that comes up that's large, and I know that's probably not, you know, creeping up into this arena, but we do have certain funding restrictions because of that.
All right, everyone, let us wrap up and move on to the next group.
All right, everyone, it is time to rotate. All right, it is time to move.
one minute. Right, everybody, it's time to wind down our conversations. All right, can I have everybody's attention? It's always such a fine line between cutting off conversation and honoring everybody's thoughts. All right, um, wonderful and fair facilitators, do you need a minute to synthesize before you're ready to report out? Do you want a two or three, four, five minute break? Or are you ready to go? Okay, um, Chuck, it sounds like you just volunteered yourself to report out first. <laughs> Well, so discount rates, a relatively challenging discussion, uh, fresh out of school and all. Um, so I started each conversation, you folks will all recall, by talking about kind of the bookmark, book ends that Greg described uh, in his presentation about discount rates. Um, there was essentially what's typically the private business discount rate. Um, which uh, I'm talking about the most ambitious business discount rate, which would be uh, cost of capital plus my expectations for returns compared to the best deal I could ever make. So that's the, the absolute benchmark at the top. At the bottom, we had a discussion about social discount rates, the value of doing this work not only over the term of the project, but its impact on future generations. So that's quite a difference. Uh, it drives the discount rate down to zero or even negative terms. And then there's, there's kind of the thing in the middle, which was uh, relative to the cost of borrowing. So as an administrator, I ask everyone, okay, so how do, how do we depending on you know, how we address each of these discount rates, there's also needs to be some kind of anchor in our rules that we can reference on a future moving term. And so there was a fair amount of discussion about uh, potential benchmarks. Um, uh, somebody threw out a 30 year T-bill, somebody 10 year, um, there's uh, other references like uh, state of Washington, what's their borrowing rate. Now, we, we wouldn't apply that to everybody. That would be a benchmark that we did an add or subtract to, depending on how the discounting turned out. Um, I introduced in, in the conversation that there's possibly two discount rates. There was public private because they have different uh, cost to capital typically um, but a third one was thrown in as private nonprofit might have a different discount rate as well um, once again I keep asking people how do I benchmark this against something and 
that would be true for all three of these. Um, there was a little more sophisticated conversation around a, a private business consideration, which was it's not just the cost of borrowing, but it's the cost of my internal money. And I'm going to ask them to talk more about that in future meetings. Uh, how do you combine those two uh, parts into a discount rate that's reasonable? And and. Also, I need to emphasize that there, these are boundary conditions we're looking for, caps, rather than absolutes. Um, we're all there. What am I missing on discount rates that folks want to say something about? Summary's good for now. Okay. Um, with respect to utility fuel escalation rates, I presented the idea that fuel escalation rates in state government are based on the NIST Western Area Census Region uh, annual update. Um, we had folks say, uh, perhaps we use that or there's some Inflation rate published by the utility, you could use that. That was about the only variant that I can recall. Anybody else want to dive in on things they want the group to hear? All right, thank you. Um, I guess the, the kind of closing request is uh, devil's in the details. If you have any specific comments, uh, get to us. Thanks, Chuck. Um, so, yeah, devil's in the details. That's a good starting point. Um, <laughs> anyway, our group started, I think, by recognizing that this uh, useful life capital and maintenance costs are really three separate groups that behave differently, and we tried to identify them as separate uh, inputs um, into the process. And we went through a lot of uh, conversations uh, all over the board. So what I'm going to do is kind of focus on each of these separately, which we did, and uh, try to walk through them. Um, there was there was kind of broad ranging conversations around the question of a, a piece of equipment. First, you have to kind of bifurcate useful life into is it a measure life, right, as it, as identified under utilities, or is it the useful life of the equipment? And those things speak to different but important distinct. Uh, parts of uh, of the rules because useful life of the equipment can speak to the ability to defer replacement until the end of the useful life versus the useful life of the measure is an input to the LCPA process. So those things are distinct and need to be researched and, and identified separately. Uh, I think the useful life of equipment generally is probably easier to get to uh, from a manufacturer's perspective, although somebody commented that if you ask the manufacturers, they'll try to minimize that in order to maximize their profits. But, but in general, life, equipment life is fairly well understood. Also, measure life is, uh, there's a fairly wide agreement, at least amongst utilities, and, and I think there was a consensus, at least I heard a consensus in our conversations, that probably the, the, the core source for uh, measure life is the RTF and then the utilities around them at least begin that conversation with going to them for for that data, not necessarily agreeing with them. Chuck? Yes, the operational life is the expected life of a piece of equipment before it fails, as in mean time between failures, and uh, is described for a piece of equipment. And there was, a, at least I identified an issue where we're talking about systems how you identify the, uh, the, the, the uh, useful life of a system. Is it the minimum life of any component in the system or is it some kind of a composite? And I think uh, that's an open question. Uh, so that's how uh, equipment useful life is defined in general, right? The, life, the replacement uh, period and, you know, a lot of HVAC equipment might be about 15 to 20 years, just as an example, right? The expected life of your of your furnace is about 15 to 20 years. Uh, 
measure life is the life that is used in a calculation of uh, energy efficiency, basically a amortization period of the energy efficient measure uh, for a levelized cost, if you will. I don't know if I correctly described that, but they, they're coupled, but they're not exactly the same. So a uh, measure lives are sometimes also affected by what the expectation of the institution that develops it has relative to the likelihood of a replacement measure that is, is going to supersede it, for example, one type of lighting over another. So I think over the years, lighting measure lives have gone down, but I, I don't have a quote me on that. Is that helpful? Yeah, so, so, so again, yeah. So again, uh, utilities and our regional regulators or regional advisors, i.e. the RTF, are a good source for measure life and, and equipment manufacturers may be a good source for uh, equipment life. Uh, we're looking for utility alignment on that. Uh, we want uh, a, agreement on, on capital measures. And again, we, it was suggested by several people that we might survey uh, utilities in the region uh, for that conversation. Um, uh, it was mentioned component basis, individual components, again, versus systems. Uh, there are a number of, you know, uh, utility standards uh, uh, around organization. I'm sorry. Or, <coughs> there are uh, professional standards uh, for this equipment that can be uphold to, uh, i.e. Uh, BOMA and ASHRAE. One of the questions that came up was working but not efficient question. Uh, working but not efficient equipment. Is it cost effective to replace? And I think that's... Uh, one again, one of the more natty questions. So then moving uh, into capital measures, uh, again, um, cap or capital costs rather, this one is a lot more challenging and we had a lot of conversations without getting uh, really real far on that. Uh, there's, there's one strategy which would say getting multiple bids is one option, but then there's a countervailing argument that says, that for the, the parties that can't necessarily afford or have the resources to go get multiple bids, it's important uh, that there be some kind of a basis that's common uh, so that we can run a, run a program, if you will, such as RS means, which is a quoting system or an esti cost estimating system rather uh, uh, for the cost of uh, at least equipment and, and, and estimates on installation. Um, it was suggested uh, surveying market players, i.e. Um, the those that actually I install equipment to get costs, uh, obviously bundles of measures may be cheaper, so it gets even trickier. And hopefully, publishing some kind of a, a table, uh, leveraging organizations like like BOMA for those surveys. Um, uh, let's see. There's a, there's, there was some concerns, obviously, relative to a fair bid process so that the bidding isn't gamed in order to avoid actually having to implement measures. Question of funding cycles and timing in, in, in costs and how those uh, uh, relate to getting money in current budget cycles. Uh, and then hardship uh, for public entities with no ability for funding. That's a little bit out of scope, but it relates to the cost of measures, especially large um, large capital measures. Um, there's lots of conversations around that. Again, separate equipment versus bundled cost, and what kind of multipliers are you used if you're using really simple estimating, uh, and are those multipliers the same within Seattle versus out of, of region? Do you have um, measure costs that are the same in, or are they regionalized, or are they localized? There's concern about accessible process uh, and fairness around this. Again, getting back to that point of major players can leverage, potentially leverage better costs, market actors who can bundle uh, analysis with measures and potentially low bid or high bid, whatever they want to do. Um, so everybody would love it if there were tables of defaults. Uh, and, 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 and there was an interesting suggestion at the end of potentially a multi multiple um, uh, pathway uh, sort of prescriptive process where you might have sort of the baseline cost and then an appeal process where you could either take a baseline cost at like means or you could get three bids or you could go to an appeal uh, if, if none of those things fit your uh, pain. 
Uh, I think um, maintenance is, is a more amorphous uh, area. Maintenance costs are probably best, uh, to always important to consider FD cost and rolls and FD maintenance costs after. Um, and uh, the importance of including maintenance costs in new uh, equipment installations. Uh, there are a number of maintenance programs in place uh, by utilities. And it's suggested that we survey or at least study those. PSD has, a, has an RTM program. I know Edison has a, has a, a maintenance program. These have been either rate-based or structured. And there's been substantial research done around cost of O&M and cost effectiveness of O&M. Um, okay, I, that was my quick survey. Questions or other comments? So property owners, um, I know there are standard references for things like O&M. You know, they're, they're programs or there used to be, you know, thick books on everybody's desk that said this is O&M cost. What are those things called? What are the titles? Anybody know? Yeah. I recall something called whites. I don't know this business. Mean, okay, means does, for example. So anybody has clues on those reference manuals, let us know. All right, um, thank you, Chuck. Others, comments, input to this? What did I miss? Anything from the floor that we want to add? Um, oh. um, one other item that we talked about was this is a Washington state bill, and so also regional differences between obviously um, labor costs are drastically different in Seattle versus Yakima, but also, um, you know, you're going to have very different life, or, you know, partially different lifespans of equipment for, uh, you know, components out on the peninsula with a lot of salt and other, other issues versus, you know, east of the Cascades. And so just figuring out how to account for those differences because this is a Washington statewide bill. All right, on to the final section. You guys have been champions today getting through some pretty thick, heavy content, um, but we're making good progress. So uh, we're gonna talk the final thing just about kind of what should be the covered and included costs. And, and a little bit of that discussion I think involves the base case. Um, we had uh, three very healthy discussions around different things and different things to be thinking about around this. I don't think any conclusions are determined, um, but I think everyone has kind of a level of comfort that you know, when we're talking about implementation costs, as the bill describes, you know, that's going to include the capital costs of buying the equipment. It's going to include the operating, the utility costs. Uh, it's going to include the installation cost, uh, probably hiring the engineer to build the design implementation package. Um, and if it's required, measurement and ver verification costs associated with that. As we think about the baseline, we had a lot of discussions about what establishes the appropriate baseline. And, you know, is that a function of the building? Things like having, uh, you know, a, a typical baseline might be code minimum. Everything in your building should be code minimum. That's the baseline. But if you have existing equipment that's not currently code minimum, what does that baseline look like over the study period? And what do you replace that light with in three years if you've got a 20-year study period? It's probably the code minimum. Um, we talked about a baseline scenario that you know could potentially be looking at what is required of everyone that's com completing this law. So everyone has to benchmark. Everyone has to file their paperwork with the state. Everyone has some staff time associated with complying with the general rule. Um, and so maybe those are either outside the boundary of the cost test or they are part of the baseline upon which you're comparing all examples to of different ways of kind of handling that. And then, you know, I think there's some things that, you know, we were thinking probably are not likely covered costs and things, you 
know, if a building owner is taking on a project at the same time that has no energy benefits, you know, they want to paint the ceiling or redo the carpet or get some new artwork, and it's convenient to do it at the same time because they're going to have the building maybe vacant. That's certainly allowed, but maybe not an include cost within the cost of implementing a measure. Also, things like maybe erroneous, you know, if you hired a lawyer to do a, some sort of lengthy evaluation of your need to comply, that probably isn't part of your costs. Um, if you've hired an architect to really make your energy efficient measure look just beautiful, um, so it's got, you know, dramatic curves and, and is unique, um, those maybe are not core costs of, it, of implementing measure. And then we looked at some of the more kind of gray area stuff. Um, you know, should financing costs be included? How does that balance with maybe the um, economic hardship criteria uh, and, and the equity issues between different applicants? Um, what about taxes? Is this pre-tax, post-tax? And, and do, do different tax rates affect people's cost criteria? Um, what about major renovations? If you go in and you take on a project and it triggers a major renovation, does that cancel the whole project? Can you weed out just down to the level of energy efficiency measures that don't trigger the major renovation if that's killing uh, the bundle or does it kill the whole bundle? Um, evaluations around that I think are gonna be very important. And then we, we all kind of talked around, the, there is a gray line I think around the, the audit costs. Are audit costs included? What is a reasonable audit cost if it is included? There was some discussion about, um, you know, there's a large group of people who can just meet their EUIT and they aren't ever going to do an energy audit. So for, for the vast majority of people complying with this law, there is no requirement to get an investment grade audit. Um, for those people who do not have a target, which we expect to be a small group of buildings, they would be required to get an energy audit. Does that change the baseline for those two different groups or change the allowable costs? Um, if audits are included as a cost, is it Makes sense to maybe have a minimum or a maximum. You can't hire your buddy to do a $10 million investment grade audit for you and say, well, I'm done. Everything is no longer cost effective. Um, and so some of those evaluations about how to handle some of those gray level areas, I think were, were discussed. Is there other stuff I missed or important things we should be talking about? be about the end of the day. <laughs> All right, great discussion. Thanks, everybody. Um, I am going to pull up a quick list of dates. Okay. Um, in the spirit of having everybody's full attention. Okay, there we go. Um, we are concluding the fifth of a series of five workshops. Thank you so much for your participation, active engagement, and uh, just showing up. Couple key notes about what we just accomplished, looking back. Starting on October 30th, we did an introductory webinar that Chuck ran about House Bill 1257 and the Clean Buildings Law in the state of Washington. We walked you through a series of five workshops over the last six weeks with the intent to build our collective awareness about this law in the state of Washington and to raise our collective understanding about ASHRAE Standard 100. I feel like we made a lot of progress with that. We've taken general comments. We've had some really great discussion. Okay, so that's what we've just accomplished. Where are we headed now? We've got uh, some dates lined up for further workshops in the new year, in 2020. The first three dates we already have posted to our website, and we'll be working to make updates to our website um, here prior to the new year. So looking into the winter and spring, we have a lot of work in front of us. We are going to be sharpening our pencils and getting words um, to paper around um, ASHRAE Standard 100 and where we need to make adjustments to that um, as we incorporate and finalize the rule here in the state of Washington. Um, Commerce team met and talked about a four-week cadence for receiving comments and breaking things up by ASHRAE se sections and topics. 
So what you're gonna see here is a series of five comment periods. This is a draft, it's subject to change, but I just wanted to let folks know where we're headed, okay? So we'll be posting all of this information to our website. As we enter into uh, the comment period for these five um, groups of topics, we're gonna be releasing draft rule language um, on our website and through the buildings distribution list. We're gonna give you about two weeks to review that, chew on it, and come to then a subsequent workshop to talk more about it. And then you'll have two weeks after that workshop to submit formal comments, okay? So that's kind of how the cadence is gonna go. Um, comment periods will be, again, by topic grouping, and you'll have about a month to review language before you need to submit final comments. Looking forward on the schedule, the January workshop and the February workshop, we're gonna have SBW back in here um, to talk about target development, methodology, and preliminary findings that they are landing on with the intent to get input from the group and really work uh, towards that collective um, understanding. We will work to have our website updated prior to the new year so everybody can see the dates on the calendar and know where we're headed. We are gonna have um, a few meetings on the east side of the state. Uh, important to have that conversation and to allow engagement by everybody. And then one last note is we've identified the need to have a few subcommittees and additional topics that we are covering and discussing. One would be utilities uh, specifically. We really do need to have a conversation where we can be in utilities and talk about incentive and program alignment, et cetera. We're gonna be starting up these subcommittees in February of 2020. We're kicking around a few different topics that based on the themes that we've heard from you all, we know we need to talk about and there's likely some that we haven't thought of. So feel free to shoot us an email, let us know what we should be thinking about with that one. And again, we'll be posting those topics and uh, plan to the website. Anything else? Okay, before we part ways, again, I wanted to thank everybody for your active participation. Thank you, thank you, Team Commerce, for everything you have done to make these workshops happen. Everybody's amazing. Um, Greg, thank you so much for the presentation today. I don't know about you all, but I learned a lot. That was fantastic. And again, we just really appreciate everybody's active uh, engagement, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year.